I find it beneficial for my patients to have a basic understanding of spine anatomy to help them better understand the process that might be going on with their back so that they could best understand the treatment options for them. So today we're going to spend some time going through the basic anatomy of the lumbar spine with a portion of the lower back that connects the lower back to the pelvis. So this is a basic spine model. So for reference in terms of orientation, the head is up here, the belly is in the front, feet are down here below, and your back is over here. So we look at the spine from kind of a side view, we see these white bodies here in the model, which are the vertebral bodies. These are the bones that serve as the kind of support to the spine. Between the bones, these clear areas are the discs. The discs are made of two materials, the nucleus propulsus and the annulus fibrosus. These two materials together form a shock absorber. The discs, in combination with the small joints in the back of the spine, called the facet complex, are what allow us to bend, twist, and ultimately move our backs. Now, when we look at the vertebral bodies, which are the white areas here, these sometimes can form fractures or be injured from a traumatic injury. As we get older and we have osteopenia or osteoporosis, a compression fracture will affect the vertebral body, which is the bony portion of the spine. The discs, which serve as the shock absorbers between the bones or the vertebral bodies, can dry out over time or can have a herniation. So what this means is the material on the inside of the disc can sometimes pop out of place and put pressure on a nerve root or on nerve roots, which could cause unpleasant symptoms in the lower back and radiating down to the legs and the feet. When we look at the spine from the back, we could see a couple anatomic structures. First is the lamina. This is the connection of bone that kind of looks like a butterfly that is confluent or flows with the spinous processes. The spinous processes you could probably feel in your middle back, which feel like kind of a wave of bumps. Some dog breeds, like the Rhodesian Ridgeback, have prominent spinous processes, and it's why they're named a Rhodesian Ridgeback, because you could see the prominent spinous processes on that animal. The spinous processes are connected together through certain ligaments that aren't visualized on this model to give it extra support. In the back of the spine, the lamina is confluent with two areas here that form a facet complex. Each lamina has a lower inferior and a superior or upper facet. These in combination with the discs are what allow us to bend and twist side to side. These facet complexes, the superior facet and inferior facet are combined by an area of bone called the pars interarticularis. On the side of the spine, there's an outward projection called the transverse process. This outward kind of finger of bone serves as an origin or a starting point for many of the muscles that attach the spine to allow us to move and some of the muscles that allow our hips to flex upwards. When we look inside the spinal canal, we can see this yellow structure that represents the nerve roots. In the lower back or lumbar spine, these nerve roots will branch off as pairs that are numbered given their respective foramen. So these are paired as the L1, L2, L3, L4, L5 nerve roots. And in the sacrum or the keystone bone, these are named respectively S1 to S5. These nerve roots exit through a keyhole on the side of the spine between the vertebral bodies and the disc called the neural foramen. This keyhole over time may narrow as we age and the natural process of aging and arthritis can happen. Sometimes with disc collapse or narrowing, and bone spurs that could form from the joints or the facet complex, the narrowing may put pressure on nerves that could develop some of these unpleasant symptoms in the legs, which we refer to as radiculopathy. When we look at all of these bony elements together, the purpose of them is to not only give our body support and allow us to move our lower backs, but also to protect these neurologic elements, which are very delicate tissues. The lumbar spine meets the keystone bone here called the sacrum. The sacrum holds the nerve roots S1 to S5. These nerve roots will branch through these small keyholes or sacral ala, which is a form of a neural foramen. These nerve roots ultimately will form a plexus or kind of a network or superhighway of nerves that will innervate structures within our abdomen, such as our intestines and our bladder. The bottom part of the sacrum is called the coccyx or the tailbone, which sometimes, as many people know from falling on it, can call, cause a fracture or coccydinia, which is this persistent pain over the tailbone. So this is kind of the basic building blocks when we're looking at the lumbar spine or the portion of the spine and the lower back. So again, in review, combining vertebral bodies, which are the bones that are connected to the bony elements in the back forming the joints or the facet complex, 
that are sandwiched forming a segment with a bone, a intervertebral disc and a bone are used to protect the neurologic structures of the nerve roots and the cauda equina, which is the lower end of the spinal cord to allow it to branch out and innervate the muscles and the skin to ultimately give us function and sensation to our lower extremities. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you found this educational and it'll help answer some questions in regards to the spinal condition you may or may not have been diagnosed with. If you're suffering from a spinal condition affecting your lower back or having a problem that it won't go away, feel free to make a consultation with myself or one of our other spine providers here at the Orthopedic Center of South Florida. We can be reached at 954-473-6344. I'm Dr. Peter Diamore, and thank you again for tuning in.